Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always with silent co-host Ludwig von B. And today we're talking about A Room with a View of the Blues by Johnny Adams. This is a tape I own really coincidentally. It was actually a Christmas gift from my wife last year. And I imagine she just picked it because it looked cool or maybe she thought, hmm, you like U.S. history. Johnny Adams sounds kind of like John Adams. I don't know. Uh, but I had actually just heard Johnny Adams for the first time a couple weeks ago on the radio. And I, I honestly couldn't tell you what radio station. I, I feel like we have a, a rock radio station, a, a jazz radio station. And I, I, I don't know if he sort of snuck in as sort of on the fringes of either of those kind of audiences. Uh, but regardless, I just remember hearing him and thinking, he has a really nice voice. I'd like to know more about this guy. Now, it turns out that Johnny Adams was someone who was, you know, famous on the New Orleans scene since the 1950s. He was very close to another quite famous New Orleans mu musician, the pianist Dr. John, uh, who's credited on, on various of these songs under his real name, which I believe is Malcolm Rebenack. But really until like sometime in the late 70s or the 80s, really, he, he didn't break through with more of a mainstream audience. So even though this album is released when he's well into middle age, I believe he was born in the early 30s, this album from 1988 counts as a pretty early and important release for him, and it certainly has a great title. So Room with a View, view uh, the title track, is a blues song, but a blues song with a kind of rich, jazzy feel to it, particularly in the rich of the drumming. Uh, the relaxing jazz feel in turn makes it sound almost Christmassy. Like maybe it was just because I was listening to it in December. But the point is, it's a nice, rich sound, uh, which is not necessarily what one expects listening to uh, to a blues record. I assume the title is in reference to the story about wealthy British people visiting Italy, and it's sort of subverting that meeting uh, by making it about a person with a not very nice life in a seemingly crummy apartment, but saying, hey, at least I have a room with a view. One thing I like about this record is that while Johnny Adams clearly likes the blues, uh, he does sort of space out the blues songs from one another. I remember listening to the Rolling Stones Blue and Lonesome album, for instance, and saying, I could see how you like a lot of these individual songs, but Blues, almost by definition, all the songs sound very similar, so don't you get sick of it very quickly. So I like the the pacing here. He very much celebrates the the blues tradition uh, while, uh, while still spacing out that sound, bringing in things that are different. Track number two, I Want to Do No Wrong, is a Gladys Knight and the Pips cover. It also brings in some cool piano that's kind of reminiscent of the riffs on a Ray Charles is I'm a fool for you or Carol King's you make me feel like a natural woman uh, and it's otherwise just a nice lush ballad and he makes use of great dramatic pauses you know Johnny Adams was a singer and he certainly you know pulls all the stops with his voice to make his songs as interesting and lively as possible. Track number three is called uh, Not Trustworthy brackets a lying woman so this one brings back the blues, but again, Adams finds a way to make each blues song sound a little different. So this one has more of a sort of boogie woody, woogie piano in the background. It's one of the first of several songs written by Percy Mayfield. So as far as I can tell, Johnny Adams wasn't really a, a songwriter, uh, and he seemed to particularly like turning to particular artists and songwriters again and again. So Gladys Knight, uh, Percy Mayfield, someone named Doc Pomus, who I hadn't heard of before, I, I think he even has a whole album of just Doc Palmer's songs and of just Percy Mayfield songs. But yeah, Percy Mayfield seemed to be a, a blues songwriter who was a big influence on him and not trustworthy. It's not a great song, but like a lot of blues, it, it's a little bit fun. It has a, a little bit of a humor to it. You know, second verse builds up to a uh, girlfriend lying about her name. Uh, I don't know. Just thought it's decently executed. Track number four is Neither One of Us Brackets Wants to Be the First to Say Goodbye. So again, shifting it up from the blues. This is another uh, Gladys Knight song. Uh, and this one is written by a singer-songwriter named Jim Weatherly, who when uh, when you hear his originals of the songs, they sound more singer-songwritery than uh, the thick production of Gladys Knight. Uh, but he, yeah, he wrote the original Midnight Train to Georgia, originally calling it Midnight Train to Houston. Anyway, performed by uh, Johnny Adams. This is a beautiful, slow song. There's not necessarily too much to say about the lyrics, but the phrasing is wonderfully dramatic. Uh, and again, he pulls out all stops. He brings in a really intense falsetto at the end, which 
like a lot of falsetto, is right on the line between sounding technically amazing and sounding very silly. His, his falsetto is virtually screaming. It sounds very good, but it sounds ridiculous at the same time. So I believe on some re releases of this record, there's another Percy Mayfield song called How Wrong Can a Good Man Be? Uh, but that's not on this version. Uh, I looked a bit into that song. Uh, it seemed actually maybe like the it would have been the most interesting lyrical song on this record because it's about the idea of, you know, when do you get to perceive yourself as good slash when do you have to listen to the criticism of others? Uh, but regardless, not on this tape. Uh, track number six, starting side B of the tape, is Body and Fender Man. This is a blues song, but again, shakes up the sound a bit. It has this cool percussion where it's like a drum fused with, uh, with a cowbell and how it sounds. It has that sort of upbeat, free city slicker feel, kind of like Disney's Oliver and Company. Lyrically, it's not perfect. You know, sometimes the, the words like, I'm your body and Fender Man, I can fix your car. You know, they don't have that perfect rhythm to melodically blow off your tongue. But just as I was saying in my review of John Lennon and Yoko Ono sometime in New York City, occasionally you can have kind of sloppy lyrics, but if the music production below them is really good, it breathes a new life into those lyrics. It takes their imperfect realness and makes them kind of fun. Track number seven is called I O U. Now for the first time we have two blues songs in a row, though this one is you know, slightly different than your standard blues. It's, I guess, what you call spooky blues, you know, kind of a screaming Jay Hawkins kind of thing. And if you look at the lyrics, it's possible to interpret this one as maybe being a bit more interesting in its subject matter. I owe you and you owe me. We owe each other too much to let it be this way anymore. Down on this never been. It's never been like this before. I believe in your honor. Ever since the first night, you've been my shelter and I've been your guide. So, Sort of, uh, at, when you first hear it, you assume just another love song, but when you look at these lyrics, it sounds like it's about the relationship between two close, like, mafia guys who can never really trust each other. I don't know how possible that interpretation is, but it makes this song, uh, and the only one on here where Johnny Adams is a co-writer, and I believe Dr. John is the other writer, it, it makes this, you know, possibly uh, the most edgy song on the record. Track number eight is called Wish I'd Never Love You At All. The vocal performance here is at its best, and the musical production is kind of rich. I couldn't tell what the origins of this one were. The only other version of the song I found was one recorded as a duet between Ray Charles and Gladys Knight, also in 1988. So I don't know if this is one where Johnny Adams does have the signature version. And I thought, yeah, it was an amazing performance. It kind of reminded me of Meatloaf songs. I think the problem is sort of Meatloaf's selling point is he's over the top and silly. Whereas this one is over the top, but not quite silly. So it comes across as a very good song. It just doesn't do anything to make itself unique and memorable. Track number nine is called The Hurt Is On. This brings back Percy Mayfield, uh, this favorite composer of Johnny Adams. I think I forgot to mention he's the composer of Hit the Road Jack. So if you don't know Percy Mayfield from anywhere else, you probably know him from that Ray Charles song. And it's a, just a song about wanting to hurry up and get married. The album ends with a song called A World I Never Made. This is a slow, jazzy kind of croon. And it's about a never-ending, yet mild and manageable sense of adequacy. And it's punctuated by, by its chorus of I'm a stranger and afraid. So overall, a lot of good performances. It doesn't take much listening to Johnny Adams to see why he was such an engaging performer and why he was able to stay relevant on the New Orleans scene for so long able to attain bigger fame later in life than many would. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if I come across more of his music later. No doubt it'll be more great performances, uh, but also like other singers who mostly do cover songs, it's also a gateway to discovering some of these other artists. Percy Mayfield is not someone I thought about much before, but it'll be a name that's hard to forget after listening to this. So let me know your thoughts about Johnny Adams in the comments below. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig Von B. See you next time.